Hello, everyone. Welcome to this first Tate late chat for tonight. Um, I'm Marlene Boschen. I'm the adjunct curator in art and ecology here at Tate, and I'm very excited to be joined by sound artists Laura Selby and Brian de Sousa for this first session, which is all about mushrooms and collaboration and sound and composition. So we've conceived it as a listening session as well. Um, and there'll be a few sound pieces throughout the session. So I'll start by introducing our guests. Um, Brian de Sousa is a class region born London-based sound artist and DJ often performing under the alias Auntie Flow. He is the founder of Sound Health Company Swell Studio and Estate of Flow Records. His practice involves incorporating the sounds of nature through field recording and biosonification with sound therapy techniques to create what he terms acoustic ecologies. And Laura Selby is a sound artist and experienced designer from Croydon. She's fascinated in revealing the hidden perspectives and narratives of organisms through sonification, from mycelium, moss, concrete to microbe. Her methodologies include extended field recordings, participatory workshops, performance and sculpture to create deeper empathic connections and revel in the polyphonic chorus of hidden ecologies. And to kick us off, we're going to start with two sound pieces, um, one by Laura, one by Brian, and then delve into what that is, what we're hearing. about your practice through what we've just heard and yeah how did you end up listening to mushrooms in your work yeah so um that recording you just heard uh, the first one was a raw recording from moss and um, from the perspective of moss sort of what i was kind of going for using contact microphones and while i was listening 
I could see an earthworm moving across. Um, so that's kind of that lower end as well, a uh, sound, which is really interesting. And how that links to mycelium and mushrooms, I also really love um, experiencing these different sounds from these different ecosystems through using mainly contact mics and hydrophones. Um, and from listening and then discovering conceptually about how the mycelium network works um, and this thing called mycorrhizal connection, where there's this um, interspecies connection. And through listening to these different species just gave me a kind of deeper empathetic response to those listenings. And then that spurred me on to try to explore how through sound I can sort of bring other people to this sort of response and way of connecting to the non-human. Um, so my piece was the second piece um, that you heard. It was uh, part, uh, from this EP that I've actually brought with me that we just released on vinyl last week called Mycorrhizal Fungi. Um, but the original piece um, was called Reishi. It's from Reishi uh, Mushroom. And I made it using a process called biosonification or bioelectrical music as sometimes it's referred to. And essentially it's a process that picks up the electricity from living things, in this case the fungi, and trans transforms it into musical instrument notes on a scale, MIDI, if you are a musician, uh, you'd be familiar with the term. And then I just map it onto a bunch of synth synthesizers. Um, in this case, uh, some modular synthesizer setup, um, which is kind of like a living or musical embodiment of the, the, the mycelial network, which I think is quite nice, has a nice resonance with the whole project. Um, but yeah, the original commission for the piece was, um, but this time last year actually, it was two projects that came and landed on my lap. One was a commission from uh, the Chelsea Flower Show, and I worked with a garden um, that was one of the show gardens there by a company called Wild City Studios, and they used a lot of like wildflowers, and the whole idea was about urban gardening and bringing the kind of idea of like, you know, nature and the urban environment uh, is something that can be a thing of beauty. And, you know, they curated this garden space that had a lot of wildflowers or weeds, for whatever a better term, but also this um, uh, mushroom den at the back of it. And this was this kind of like, kind of iron sort of structure that had uh, fungi growing inside it. Um, they used a lot of like kind of atmospheric lighting, um, and there was sort of smoke coming out and things like that. So it looked really alien and things. And I guess for my piece, I wanted to make kind of artistic decisions to try and embody that kind of the alien feel, especially with ratios. as you heard that mushroom. It's like, if you know what it looks like, um, you know, it looks it looks like it's it's very kind of, you know, extra extraterrestrial and stuff. So so that was one of the commissions. And then at the, at the sort of same sort of time, I got asked to um, uh, make a piece for a Glastonbury Festival at the the Hayes Pavilion, which is a, p a pavilion they were building in the Silver Hayes area that was built out of out of mushrooms, out of the mycel mycelium from mushrooms. And it was just another use case of, you know, how brilliant mushrooms are. They can be used as a building product, as well as a sound material, as well as many other things. Um, I think that's why I think a lot of you are in the room, because they're so fascinated by the potential of, of fungi and mushrooms, and certainly, you, you know, like my explorations into it, just it's a gift that keeps on giving. So yeah, I got commissioned to do that, and it was a nice coincidence that I'd just been using this biosonification process with, with the, uh, the Chelsea Flower Show project, and I turned that into the piece that was then played for the entire duration of Glastonbury Festival on loop for 15 minutes. You could go into this, uh, this pavilion and, and hear that, <laughs> which apparently a lot of people did after the music, main music had finished at 3 a.m., so imagine, you know, transport yourself there, it's quite an interesting yeah. experience forever. And then uh, your mushrooms can bring in the whole other dimension of the, the old psychedelics and everything else. So yeah, that's my relationship. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you just said about mushrooms feeling so alien or other. And like, something I've been thinking about is how we are also changed by the things we research or spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and there's this really nice quote from Merlin Sheld Sheldrake's Entangled Life, which is this um, book about mushrooms and mycorrhizal networks. And I'm just going to read it. He says, like, they asked me how the fungi were imprinting themselves on me. I'm still not sure, but I continue to wonder how, in our total dependence on fungi, as regenerators, recyclers, and networkers that stitch worlds together, we might dance to their tune more than we realize. So just kind of being impacted by what you're working with at the same time. I was wondering, yeah, in your processes of 
um, studying these mushrooms or moss or other sort of life forms so deeply? Like, how has that affected you? It might be like the beetle that he talks about or the ant in the book where it's like the death bite. <laughs> so the, my, the, the, the mycelium is really in their bodies and, and it's really taken over. And um, yeah, so hopefully I don't die as a result of these projects. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's fascinating. As I said, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hidden in plain sight for me anyway. I mean, it's, it's more my ignorance than anything else. But this whole idea of like the power of nature and the wood wide web, as he also refers to in the book, and it's a term that maybe a lot of you have heard, but you know, how powerful that is, you know, how omnipresent it really is. And obviously, you know, as species ourselves, you know, having evolved to kind of believe in sort of human essentialism and us being at the top of the food chain and everything else, I think like that, you know, learning more about mycelium and the, the mycorrhizal connections, etc., really helps to kind of break down that hierarchy and uh, get us all on a level playing field where, you know, it's nature is as, as an equal part to, 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 to us as human beings and we can all survive and thrive in the planet together if we just listen and, 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 uh, and, and learn more about what actual nature, you know, the nature and natural processes are doing. Yeah, it's sort of like the non-human perspective. I think once you begin realising that there are all these voices around us, but I guess something that fascinates me is this change of time scale. Um, so we all exist on our own time. And, you know, from birds to mycelium to trees to the universe, it all has its scale of time. And like for us, it can feel quite unfathomable to, to truly connect to these different beings. Um, but sound is this really interesting tool to bridge to these temporalities and, and you know, how we can use that to help um, create that kind of empathy between um, us and the non-human. And then I guess from that, it can help us learn so much from these different species and how they collaborate already with each other um, and, and find their ways of communicating, like how they con contemplate communication is really interesting. We have our version, what we know. And then when you go on a different scale of time, there is this kind of interplay, uh, which is really, really interesting. And I guess something that I, I've personally learned is how when I can listen to these other things, it helps me grow and keep working on that level of empathy of listening. Um, and trying to take that moment and, uh, and I guess kind of seeing different perspectives that we can take on our kind of human to human relationship as as well as human to non-human and learning about non-human etc yeah yeah I think like I totally resonate with that resonates with me because with, t with time time is an interesting thing as a, as a musician because with you know we talk about AI and the march of machines and stuff like that right now but you know machines have been able to keep time as a musician you know for decades now and like you just use your you know computer with your your DAW and you're immediately on the clock right but but prior to the ability to have drum machines and things like that keeping a regular time it was the live drummer and it was the musicians in the room and it was the human connections that were being made and that sort of paradigm has sort of been lost I think a lot with modern music and the ease of production and things like that so a lot of what's inspired me with this kind of work is actually you know getting away from the kind of the clock and the rigidity around that mm. And, and really just kind of exploring the time that's set by nature or set by the processes that are at play. So with the, with, with the work with fungi, it's like really just playing to their time. Nothing is set on a, on a, on a, on a, on a set kind of a metronome. Mm. And that means that actually you can never predict what's happening. You have this randomness to the whole thing, which I think gives it kind of more endless possibilities because as human beings, you know, we kind of really are adept at picking up patterns, and especially when it comes to music and, and say, popular music, we really understand the formula that it that comes, whether you're a big pop music fan or not. You kind of understand the verse, chorus, structure, and things like that, because we've just listened to so much of it. Um, but, you know, by doing that, pop music can become very predictable, and, you know, we have to, like, in, in, you know, consume a lot to kind of keep us entertained. Whereas I find myself returning more and more, listening to, I could listen to my modular setup with Fungi playing it yeah. li literally for hours and hours and hours. And your whole concept and notion of time, like, yeah. it's completely lost. I mean, it's just like, you, you know, you're completely away from, you know, understanding that, that click, click, click metronome. Yeah, and I think that's a really nice transition to the second part of the um, listening pieces you've selected to kind of give image to that process as well. So we've got two short films now.
Brian, maybe first to you. Um, I was just thinking, listening um, and watching the modular synthesizer, there's something so soothing in like, how the translation of the mushroom signal ends up as a sonic kind of piece. And I was wondering how you think about like the experience of pieces. I know you're interested in sort of the therapeutic effects of sound as well. And yeah, how you're sort of developing that in your work. Yeah, um, so I mean, that was an example of the, the modular setup. Um, and actually, I, I played that live. We put on an event called Mushroom Music last week, last this time last Friday, actually, on, at Earth and Hackney. And um, it was fantastic. I mean, it was amazing to, you know, just, you know, and this is another example of how, you know, resonant mushrooms and fungi are because, you know, we had 600 people through the door last week and it's another full house tonight. So there's something that really, you know, draws people in. And, um, and I guess, yeah, for, for, for my kind of, practice with my swell studio work um you know uh, there's there's a number of different factors away so i i trained as a sound therapist um and kind of really interested in how frequencies affect brain and body and affect our, our you know you know our, our parasympathetic nervous system or autonomic nervous system like really just like affect our kind of levels of consciousness as well which i think is like really fascinating and i've also you know just keeping it on the fungi tip like worked with imperial college with their um, psychedelic therapy trials and music is a big part of the experience of psychedelic therapy. You know, you literally, you take the, you know, you take the, the psilocybin in this case, and you know, you're listening to music on headphones for six hours or eight hours or something like that. So it's really kind of like a, a very much a, an integral part and a supporting role of that therapeutic kind of process. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot to be said with how sound can be used as a therapy for, you know, the benefit of mental health and, and other kind of like, um, uh, helping with other people's like health issues, and I think that y you know we we sometimes again back to my pop music example can be that 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 kind of point can be lost because we think of music as being this kind of thing of entertainment. You know, we're going to like have a dance and things like that. But even dancing is very therapeutic as well. You know, like you're you're in your own world and you're you're letting yourself go and things like that. And that's that's really important and stuff. So, yeah, I guess one of the things that I'm trying to do is just explore different ways in which we can kind of harness the potential and power of, of sound and then help um, people because, you know, we are also, as I said before, you know, expert listeners. You know, we spend all this time listening to music. So we're very open minded to actually hearing like different frequencies affect our, you know, our mood in different ways. You know, we kind of return to music from our childhood so often because it has such resonance with us and can make us feel happy, can make us feel sad, etc. And that's just on the very top line level. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's yeah, it continues to fascinate me. Laura, do you want to respond to that as well? Maybe also in terms of how you're working with participants in your projects and these ideas around collaboration, but maybe also contamination, how that comes into it. Yeah, no, I really resonate with what you were saying about kind of giving this listening as a tool. So um, so you'll, you can see some few images and I'm sort of working on this creative uh, research based around contamination, sonic contamination. And it's all sort of inspired by um, Anna Singh's text, uh, uh, Mushroom at the End of the World, where she talks about contamination as this term that really means collaboration. Um, and so through listening, I wanted to explore that. So part of my work was um, doing lots of workshops in this idea of extended listening. And so um, taking participants out to listen to certain spaces, they choose a certain location, and then we go around together collaboratively to also listen together. Um, using contact mics um, and other mics to get this kind of other perspective to a space that they've already sort of spent some time with listening, kind of exploring that as a tool to then have these conversations about how can we connect to these different beings and what are you noticing through your listening and, and again talking about that change in scale and time um, through those listenings. And then these then went on to different um, outcomes. So it can be quite complex when we think about trying to connect to the non-human because when you explore a biological system, the more you look at it, the more it becomes more com complicated and really amazing. You realize all these things are working together and life is occurring. And so I guess how I was adapting to that uh, as an artist is going at this idea lots of different ways to in the hopes that it'll have lots of different entry points for people to sort of think about these things. Um, and so one of the other um, elements was, uh, so workshop, and then I worked with performers. Um, so try c composing a piece for um, human and non-human um, performers, um, instrumentalists and moss. 
um, who was really good that day when we recorded it. So that was that was great. It sort of worked well. Um, and uh, and then um, I wanted to look at visually as well. So I worked with chromatography. So looking at the different sites that I was recording and collecting samples and exploring how can I visually represent what's happening on a chemical scale and um, to act as an a anchor for people when they're listening to these different beings. Um, and, um, and then also uh, working with sculpture, so uh, con conductive thread as a tool to create a touch sonic sculpture piece so that people could play and use it as an interface through these field recordings that I collected so they could touch and feel the piece. But also it's kind of getting you to think about how our traces um, sort of extend to the other, uh, these different sound worlds and beings. Um, and so that was really interesting. And yeah, lots of things. Yeah. But I think it's, yeah, just kind of exploring that idea. I mean, one, what, sorry, what, one of the common threads just from what you're saying and certainly in my practice as well is just this, this idea of just listening, deep listening, I guess, is one mm. way of framing it. It's like, you know, we live in these busy like lives and worlds and you know there's so many things trying to grab our attention the attention economy etc and um so much of our sort of sonic experience although our ears don't blink you know we we're often listening very passively and you know if part of the practice in terms of a, a therapy and it seems like part of your practice as well is just really kind of trying to return to this whole idea of like active listening being in the moment it's a mindfulness practice and one of the best ways to do it, and I would encourage everyone to try and have a bash at this, is is going out and field, you know, doing some field recording yeah. with a microphone. You could do it on your phone with headphones in, wherever it is. You could be anywhere, just outside there. But it's a lens into the world that it will just surprise you. I mean, it certainly surprised me. I had a great experience through this in lockdown, where I really kind of deepened into my practice and got like, you know, the problem is it starts to become never ending, getting better and better <laughs> microphones and, and all that stuff. But <laughs> but it's it's it is there is a world out there. I mean, the other sort of slightly depressing thing is you then hear all the industrial noise and the planes going over and everything else. So if you can avoid that, that's also kind of nice. But it's part of our world, right? And it's just something that we are so habituated to our sonic environment, our soundscape, um, that we never really take time to think about it. And uh, I think you know the practice of field recording allows us that lens into it, which is really powerful. And do it together. So what was really fun was doing those field recordings, like having that um, collaboration and listening to that moment. So that first recording you heard um, that was from Moss, that was particularly personal moment for me because um, I had this group of us, I was sort of like, come and listen to this. It's, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. And it was that moment of like wonderment. Um, and for me, sitting there with everyone was sort of discussing this perspective that we're hearing from something that we just walk past normally you know we, there's moss also around the cities that we inhabit um so it was just this really lovely moment and then for me it was this moment of stillness that um like as someone who struggles with meditation i hadn't sat still for 20 minutes before and i realized that i've been sitting for 20 minutes just absolutely absorbed in the sound world of moss yeah Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this moment or invitation from both of you for everyone to go out in the world and listen is maybe a good moment as well to open to some questions. We've got just a few minutes left if anyone in the audience has a question. Yeah, we've got some moving mic. Um, thank yeah, thank you for the talk. It's been really, really fascinating, really interesting. Um, I was really like uh, uh, excited to hear you talk about the mushroom at the end of the world because I absolutely love that piece of work. It's such an amazing, amazing piece. And I just wondered, uh, for me anyway, I came out of that thinking that I can no longer really separate mushrooms from ideas of apocalypse and climate collapse. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was wondering how you both incorporated sustainability into your practice. Yes, so um, I was really, with my sculpture work, um, I was really wanted to make sure it was a sustainable piece. So I worked with sort of bundle dyeing and using 100% um, linen, so things that can biodegrade eventually. And I think that's a really important thing when we're working with things that we want to listen to the non-human and their voice, but it's really important that we're not just taking. And I think something that I'm constantly grappling with as an artist is that obviously through recording, I'm having this human perspective again. It's We're using tools that have been human made. So I think it's really important um, 
thinking about that and being aware and transparent about how you're uh, creating these things and, and the practices that you're using. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to um, Earth Percent, um, charity set up by Brian Eno. It's the charity that I work with. Um, and they've just launched a campaign called Sounds Right. And I don't, you're nodding, you might have heard of it, but it, essentially it, it, it grants the earth or nature as a composer. So essentially nature can acquire royalties from your music. So you could say, and it, it was like a penny drop moment for me because I've used field recordings and I've used nature in my music for, for a decade or whatever and um, never thought to give it a credit, you know. And now, now I can, and th I think that's a really positive step, like forward. And um, and yeah, I'm happy to support them. Ten percent of you know the record sales that we've got here and the stuff we're doing with the state of flow goes goes to them, and that goes through a number of different um, charity partners that that uh, yeah that help them support the environment and sustainability. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. And I think there was a second question over here somewhere. Uh, we're streaming as well. This is on. Oh, there we go. Uh, you spoke about patterns before. I just wondered if there was anything external that you found had an effect on the sound you were hearing, whether that be time of day or temperature or humidity or if there was anything or even between different mushroom types. I just wondered if it's completely random or if there is anything that you take from it like that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like at the start of my journey to explore that and answer that question. I met a, a guy that's done a PhD in this last week before my event, Gus Sluder, you should look up his stuff. And he literally spent a PhD trying to figure that question out and still can't answer <laughs> exactly what is happening. and. Uh, he talks about a lot of the devices, the biosonification devices you can get off the internet or whatever has, has just been a bit phony or whatever. And a lot of the times you're just actually just picking up electricity or the earthing of that electricity and things like that. Um, at best, it might be the kind of galvanic kind of skin response that's water based and, and that would then be affected by the time of day and the sunlight and you know the amount of water that the, the fungi might have had. So I haven't, I, I, I don't know exactly. I know that when I've now experimented with different species of fungi, they all give a different kind of response. But, um, you know, I made the joke last week at the event that they're essentially they're decomposing whilst they're on stage. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it became a bit of fraught at the end of my performance because I'm pretty sure one of them just died <laughs> and uh, stopped giving me any <laughs> Anything. Maybe just didn't want to play. I didn't like what I was doing with it, but um, stage fright or something. But yeah, um, it's an interesting old thing. Um, I'd recommend um, looking at Professor Andrew Adamansky's work because um, I had the pleasure of he had been trying to track the micro um, sort of changes in voltage between different stimuli. So he's been exploring that in that kind of language um, through these like changes in voltage, which was really interesting. So one of the projects I got to work on was using that data and trying to sonify that and then working with uh, RAVE, uh, which is a type of machine learning algorithm that came from the ERCAM forum, which is the forum for um, mu electronic music. And um, basically using that as a basis to train um, a machine learning model from non-human field recordings. So I used the field recordings I've done and then we fed back in these um, data signals that he'd collected to create this new form of sonification, which is really interesting. But going back to your question, I think check out his stuff because he was looking at if it is possible to track through different um, stimu stimulus that it would change slightly, which is really interesting and it uh, was really exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, sounds like there's lots of potential for future work in these areas and so many more questions we could be asking you. We're sadly out of time for this session now, so please join me in thanking Laura and Brian and um, enjoy the rest of your evening.
gravity. <laughs> Thank you.
Where is the camera? Not on air. Make your way to the front, please. Yeah, make your way to the front.
Hello, testing, testing, one, two. Is this working? Hello. Can people hear me? Does this work? Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. <laughs> it works. Greetings. <laughs> um, we are Shortwave Collective. Um, and uh, just to introduce ourselves, this is Georgia. I'm Brigitte. This is Sasha and Hannah. Um, we're going to have a bit of a chat tonight about the collective, covering things like what does it mean to be in a collective, um, how we collaborate and make things together. Um, we'll share some of our experiments and some of our failures uh, through the lens of DIY, feminisms and knowledge sharing. And uh, Georgia and I will give a little bit of context to the collective now. Um, we are an artist group interested in feminist practices and exploring radio as artistic, as an artistic material rather than a medium. Radio waves have traveled the globe long before humans and will likely exist long after we have gone. In the meantime, we've developed ways to use radio waves to send and receive information around the world through devices like the humble radio you might find in someone's kitchen or car. Shortwave Collective is interested in the whole radio spectrum, the human-generated sounds catching a ride on a radio wave like your favourite radio station, maritime communications or Morse code signals, uh, to naturally existing radio which is generated by atmospheric conditions like solar storms and lightning. Nice. So we met four years ago during COVID. It was lockdown and we were at Sound Camp, but Sound Camp was online. So we just started as kind of a discussion group. We were interested in feminist methodology, working together, and just kind of breaking out of the box of sound and tech, which tends to be quite masculine. And I think to get us started, we'll do a clip from our Stewart Tracks commission, which is called the Living Radio Lab. It was for the Stewart Tracks Biennale for Sound and Listening just last August. This was a major commission that we had where we built a living radio lab. And Sam? Um, I think we will do a little oh. sound oh. synopsis. I'm just sorry, before yes. the video, um, just for the online audiences, we're just going to have a little talk through the sounds that we're going to hear. Um, so this was in Denmark uh, on the coast. So we've got kind of um, uh, dock ambience, kind of industrial shipping sounds, um, and then we use hydrophones. So uh, these are underwater microphones um, that were capturing basically like a party of oysters underneath the uh, surface. Um, so they're kind of lots of pops and crackles. Um, and then our experiments with our radios. So uh, feedback, um, kind of radio signal wafting in and out of signal reception and uh, yeah, uh, on, uh, in a sound walk through kind of the most industrial parts of um, Struer that we found. Okay, hit it. Shortwave Collective is an international feminist radio art group. As part of Stuart Tracks by Enel, we set up a laboratory to invite visitors into the process of developing, experimenting, and listening with homemade devices. We gave attention to the fragile, uncertain pluralities of radio listening. We're brought together by our interests in radio and feminist approaches. We work collaboratively to demystify sound technology and explore the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm doing a diagram of the amp circuit and I'm trying to make it as easily understandable as possible. I feel the sweet contagion of experimentation. I saw Brigitte use this wonderful circle for the diode that she made and then it makes me want to see kind of feather work as a coil base and very sweet feeling. 
So basically, I am transmitting via my homemade AM transmitter and you are receiving it via your homemade open wave receiver. Okay. Have a listen. So on each radio... But interestingly enough, I can't actually hear it on a store bought radio. Yeah. But that's... Oh, oh yes, there I can. There we go. So we're definitely getting AM on this radio and you're picking up FM on that radio. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, turn that one down. At sunset, this is the time of day on the cusp of night time, when radio transmissions travel more easily around the globe, enabling stronger signals to be received from further away. The air is full, and what we hear are layers and layers of radio wafting in waves over the top of one another. An air that was thick with voices, languages, singing, static and buzzes. We are hearing distance and the weight of signal all in the air, feeling the fullness of the radio experience all around us. Uh, shout out to, um, if you can hear me still, hey, shout out to Francesca Oldfield who produced that film for us and followed us around. Denmark for a few days incredibly generously and made this beautiful uh, film for us. That's just a short extract, but more will be online soon. Um, we wanted to start off by talking about, if we could have the next slide, please, about um, what we mean by uh, DIY tech. So this here is a radio. It's a radio that works. It's a radio that sometimes doesn't work. It's a radio <laughs> that is very adaptable. Uh, and here, in this example, it was built by a, um, a, someone that we met in a small town in Portugal where cork and cork bark grows on trees locally. And she found this beautiful piece of cork and she decided that she was going to use it as a baseboard for a radio that she was going to build. This is an incredibly simple radio, but it works as a receiver. So you have a coil and you have some crocodile clips. You have these bits of wire that can be found around your home that function as an antenna and as a ground. And you also have this little combination here of a uh, blued razor blade, so that means burnt until blue, with a pencil, which has been kind of roughly chopped in half, with a safety pin sticking out of it, and that is called a cat's whisker and it forms a kind of gate for radio signal. So this very unlikely looking device can actually pick up radio. And we were really interested in what were the simplest kind of components of a radio circuit, and how could we try and disrupt and take things out of these ubiquitous black boxes that house all of our technology to see if we could understand it in different ways. One super quick note is when we talk about radio, we don't necessarily mean just FM and AM radio. These things also pick up Bluetooth signals, Wi-Fi, and it, and it doesn't sound like anything you would understand. It's very crackly, very strange. So you get a lot of strange signals on there. A natural radio. Yes, I think on that point, like these are very simple devices, but they're incredibly powerful. There was one workshop at Stave Hill Eco Park that we did where people had made these open wave receivers. And there was a moment when we were at the top of the hill of Stave Park and we were listening with the receivers and someone was putting their finger on the circuit and we could hear the sound of spherics, which is the sound of lightning in Earth's atmosphere. So through this you know, batteryless, powerless, ultra simple device and through someone's body being part of the circuit, we could hear the faraway sounds of lightning. And so I think DIY is not always about like simple and cute and small. It can be very powerful. Yeah. yeah. And you've been doing a bit of a deep dive lately on the history of DIY, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we, um, we're a feminist collective and we see ourselves in a lineage of feminist DIY practices. I think one uh, reference we all share is that of radio pirate woman. Would that be fair? Mm. Yes. So this was a pirate feminist DIY radio station based in Galway in Ireland, late 80s, early 90s, when at the time when it was illegal to talk about abortion on public radio. And so someone called Margretta Darcy made a makeshift antenna on her house and was hosting conversations with women in her neighborhood on her kitchen table, around her kitchen table. 
So in these transmissions, you can hear the kind of clinking of utensils, the kind of goings on of a household, while women, at a time when it was illegal to do so, talk about abortion. And DIY is important because this antenna, it was not a far transmitting antenna, it was very local, so she could only transmit to her neighborhood. So the history of DIY is often very caught up in hyper-local practices, and this is part of their power as well. Is that okay? Yeah. And segues really nicely into how we think about feminisms as well. Yes. So the reason that we're so intent on DIY practices is because we really care about accessibility. And uh, some of us have backgrounds uh, in sound, a, a degree in music technology. And I found that the way that certain things were talked about was that uh, expensive gear is super valorized, things which have gotten the most power. And, you know, there's a sort of certain gender politics to that as well. I find that, you know, there's um, a lot of emphasis placed on the technology rather than what you can do with it and the certain creative possibilities and the way that these technologies can help us to connect with people, perhaps people who we don't know, people from different cultures or people who think differently from us. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to create something that was then really shareable with others. And this felt like using just scrap parts that you can find around your house potentially or that you can salvage or that could be free or that could be cheap could create a technology that is accessible um. and open yeah. Yeah. Um, so we this particular device um, I guess this was the first experiment in the collective right um, so it has its roots it has military roots and once we kind of started to understand the lay of the land a bit then we started to experiment and really kind of open it up, I guess. Um, so interchanging materials um, and uh, techniques and processes, just kind of like pulling it apart, encouraging each other to fail, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to see what might happen if you put that there. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of partly what led us to renaming the device um, because it became something else and for us I guess the longer we spend with this very simple device kind of the more complex it becomes. Yeah. Can we have the think? next slide as well because I think that illustrates it actually beautifully. This was a particular kind of experiment session that we had where we had got out all these textbooks about the physics of radio and we were thinking well, what does this mean? I do, have, I do not have an electronics or physics background of any type. I know very little about this. And so trying to read through these textbooks where there was all of this like assumed knowledge and language and components lists which I just found incredibly difficult to understand. And so, you know, we tried some methods for like distributing knowledge. So each of us chose like a part of the circuit mm -hmm. and then we did some research. What does this mean? What is an antenna? What, what, what could be an antenna? Could my hand be an antenna? Could, if I reach up to the sky, do I become an antenna? What are the conditions needed for an antenna to be an antenna or for a piece of like garbage that I, found, that I find to become an antenna? And this was this beautiful moment where you, Brigitte, um, we had discovered in this textbook that you needed to have them, a metal touching another metal or a mineral, like a crystal, touching a metal in order to um, change the direction of current to produce a gate, which would then act as a diode and all these words we didn't know. And so we'd learn all this theory and then you found something on the ground. I did. This is the kind of the rusty whisk thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like to find things and really the collective really support me in this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we, we started to then find kind of objects and kind of subbed them in for diodes and, um, and then uh, in a moment of, I think we, what was it? It was an afternoon where we were kind of feeling a bit frustrated and having a chat over here and then I was like well I'm just going to pull it all apart and see if that goes there and that makes and that works um and it turned out so we we it was a tent peg and it and uh it it turns out that this has been a really important material for us to kind of have a stable diode that we can kind of take around with us to different workshops. Way better than what the textbooks told us. Yeah. No complex materials were actually needed. We yep. could just use a humble tent peg. Totally. The humble tent peg. <laughs> yeah. Also useful for grounds. Also useful for grounds. Yep, exactly. 
um, uh, I would not, it has to be kind of said though that I would not have had the confidence to do that on my own. And that's something that's just so beautiful about the collective is that really, I mean, it, maybe it goes without saying, but like we really are greater than the sum of our parts. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's kind of the beauty of collective, collective practice. Yeah, yeah. I, like I, I never had the confidence to build a radio in the first place and then attempt to put a bread, a metal bread box in the circuit. It's, it's an absurd thing to do, but it worked. I got signal. <laughs> I remember bread box radio. <laughs> <laughs> there was also a moment that we attached our radios to fences. So we went around our neighborhoods in London and attached our open wave receivers to like little um, fences of houses, fences in parks, and a fence can be an antenna. So we used these fences to listen to what the fences were hearing in the radio spectrum. And I got like local AM radio. Like we were actually together in Burgess Park attaching to like a fence over a BMX track. Yeah. And so we had this like fence tenna work that was all about radios plus listening to fences. So the humble fence. We just got static, Lisa and I. <laughs> yeah. But that's part of it. <laughs> oh, I love that though, that, that's the f that, that we're listening to what the fence is listening to. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> Yes, what do fences here? <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is where we share. So, you know, now that we've found this beautiful thing, firstly, we have discovered that working together is amazing, even though we didn't know each other before we met in a serendipitous way where we all happened to be in the same place and discovered that we all had the same desire to learn together as equal non-experts. So we found that, but we've also now got this design for the simplest possible radio. We've given it a name, and we've started to try and share that with other people. So we run workshops really regularly, uh, you know, up and down the country, wherever people invite us, where we teach other people to make these radios. And every time we run a workshop, we learn so much. It's very much like research in process. This isn't something that we kind of roll out and replicate, and it's the same every time. It's really like where our knowledge comes from, and something that we also try and share back in the community. So our website, for example, has got lots of resources on it where everything that we've learned, like spreadsheets of here's all the people who we have discovered who have been influential to our practice and our ways of working. Here's the texts and the things that we have found about them. But we also share our different recipes for homemade radios so that people can make them at home. We post people little packs of materials. We make zines and we distribute them, which share some of these instructions. It's also super site specific. I think this workshop was in Leeds, and we encourage people to personalize their radios, to bring in some, bring in whatever weird metal thing you have at home, stick it in the circuit, see if it works, and then plug it into the city itself. So we could do, we could plug it into the bin, plug it into a fence, plug it into a lamppost. What do bins here? No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> this was we we did a fence in a churchyard, and we got football. It was football. <laughs> Yeah, that has been a frustrating thing. I have, I'm, f I'm afraid, a hatred of football. And I, <laughs> we ran this workshop for three hours for 30 people. And at the end, we had 30 radios all broadcasting talk <laughs> sport. <laughs> a feminist practice of amplifying the sounds of men talking about football. Kids get involved in our workshops. They are th this is a super inclusive, accessible workshop. We have had um, people of all ages participate. We, you know, puns, as you probably can hear, are very important to our practice. We have a game where the first, if you do pick up some commercial signal radio through your homemade radio device, and the first word that you hear is the name of your radio. So we had Kebab FM the other day. <laughs> And broadcasting throughout South London yeah. but we've also heard sounds from really far away and there's this magic time of day which is called grey line so at dusk and dawn the layer of charged particles surrounding the earth called the ionosphere I did not know that this existed before we did some research as part of this collective the ionosphere is a layer of charged ions charged particles around the earth and they reflect radio waves back down to Earth. And so at that particular time of day, radio signals can reach you from incredibly vast distances. So radio can usually only travel by what's called line of sight propagation. Propagation just means traveling from A to B. So a radio wave will travel only in a straight line. But when these charged particles around the Earth are particularly dense, 
then it can bounce and be, is it refracted or diffracted? One of those words. It can bounce and turn across the Earth's curvature that way. And that means that you then you can hear radio stations from incredibly far away. When we were in Portugal, we were hearing radio from France. Um, I definitely heard radio in Chinese language before. Once I picked up a Cuban spy station. What? Yeah. How did you know it was a spy station? So the frequency I looked up later was the one, it's called HM01, which is a spy station from Cuba, and it's only sometimes transmitting. I've always gone back to that frequency, and it's never, hasn't been there. But it's a number station, so there's someone's voice reading out numbers, and those numbers are a decryption key for then data to be, uh, yeah, found, heard. I was also spent some time in Barrow in Furness in Cumbria, which is where they build the UK's um, submarines, which then some of which then carry nuclear weapons. And I was thinking about can I use these radios to then listen out to monitor um, these submarines to hear, you know, are they transmitting signal? Are they communicating between you know ground and submarine undersea? Because they use very low frequency radio. Uh, because these waves are really long, so they can travel incredible distances, including underwater. And, you know, although I wouldn't be able to decode whatever the submarines are saying, being able to hear that auditory trace felt important to be able to sort of have some citizen monitoring of what these activities are. And I think what's amazing about this is that radio is this medium that connects all of us. It's like an ocean of static, where signals are constantly bouncing between ground and sky around the Earth, satellites to the Earth's surface, submarines in the middle of the ocean, but we don't often know that we're in the midst of these signals. So having some radio literacy, having a little receiver made of just some rusty bits and some wire gives you access to this sort of like magical world mm -hmm. um, of strange and weird and eerie signals that we don't know what they are, but they are you know, uh, interesting yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. yeah, it is absolutely magic. Yeah. If somebody you know, in a classroom however many years ago, told me that, that it was actually a, a device for like capturing the energy that's, that has information in it that's around us all the time. <laughs> that's magic. I would have absolutely built one, but instead it was kind of like, put this wire here, okay, now you've done it, now you're getting radio, okay, next project. But we went to school in the 90s, Brigitte, where girls were only taught cooking. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I have an art history degree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we also, uh, speaking of our like our workshops, we we th like to think about the participants of the workshops as collaborators. Um, we really do learn from people as they learn from us, and it becomes this kind of beautiful environment where we're kind of all sharing and all exploring. Um, so if you are inspired to make a radio, <laughs> you can head to you can find us online which I think might be on the next slide. There it is. Um, and get in touch with us if you have any questions about making radios. We're always kind of happy to chat through how it happens. We have about seven minutes now. We wanted to leave some time for questions. And just so you know, there is like there are no silly questions in Shortwave Collective. We have questioned <laughs> so many things. Yeah. And there is like no shame around questions either. Uh, you know, some of the... The, the things that we've discovered is like, what is a radio wave? How is a radio wave different from an audio wave? Are those two things not the same? How does it travel? What does it do? How does it move? So if you have any questions, we have, we have some almost seven minutes now. It can be about radio. It can be about anything that we've said. Please, we actually can't see anything. Oh, we have one hand up. Let me come and just there. Um, hi. Uh, th this was super interesting, thank you. And also to answer your question, what do bins hear? They hear trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Shortwave Collective. <laughs> now one thank of you, us. that's the only reason I, no, I'm kidding. Uh, my question is, um, so you said that you can even hear Bluetooth. And I, in, a, in a city that literally everyone has their headphones on, have you ever picked up music and is that something that you can dis like can you discern what's bluetooth and what is just say some other sound 
it's a data mode. So essentially what you can hear is like, have you ever heard that sound when you've got like your speaker and someone's phone is like making that interference sound? That's what it sounds like. So one. Exactly, that's the one. And so you can't hear, like you're not plugging into the content that they're listening to, just the data. So, you know, I learned about it this way, that audio gets loaded onto a radio wave, and then the radio wave carries it to its destination where it then gets decoded. And so, like, the radio wave is like a bus. All it does is carry. And so if you're listening to the, the thing that carries, it's like you can hear the bus, but you can't hear the people on the bus. So you need a special decoder, like a radio receiver, in order to be able to extract that audio information, pull it off the radio wave, and listen to it. And so with our radio devices, then, um, yeah, they don't decode the content from the Bluetooth in the same way that they decode, like, the uh, audio signals from the AM or the FM transmissions, because it's a different sort of this word called modulation. It's a different sort of modulation, but that basically just means it's a different sort of extraction of the audio from the radio. Does that mean it's encrypted? Is it? Yeah. See, this is how we learn through our <laughs> workshops and our talks. People tell us things. We learn bits of knowledge from everyone. We try and amalgamate it and share it further. Thank you. Oh, there is a hand. Um, hi. Great talk. Thank you. Um, are you at risk or have you been in trouble with the police for spying? <laughs> I did get followed around by security in Barrow and Furness because BAE Systems, uh, who, um, yeah, they basically own the town. And so they didn't like me wandering around with a little uh, hula hoop <laughs> with a big <laughs> load of copper wire. And um, people uh, have been like artists in the area who have been trying to record, have been um, either turfed off the premises or in a couple of cases actually like forcibly removed. So, but usually. Yeah, so listening is not illegal, and you don't even have to have a radio amateur license to listen to the radio spectrum. It is, uh, I think, uh, questionably legal to listen to air traffic control. Um, I have done that. <laughs> Me uh, too. <laughs> yes, um, because it is, again, it's in this ocean of static that's just freely accessible if you have a radio. Um, but yeah, there are certain parts of the spectrum that are like less uh, legal to listen and engage with. Um, but in theory, you can listen to anything, and that's not considered spying. There are some rules around what you can say on the radio, that's though. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. yeah, transmitting is different from receiving. Yes. Uh, so you're not allowed to, on the radio, talk about, is it religion, politics, and is there a third? Like, I think, like, anything to do with culture. And uh, so basically there is a practice called amateur radio where you can get a radio call sign or license. Mine is Mike 6 India Oscar Romeo. So if I'm on the air, that's the call sign I say to whoever I'm like in contact with. Um, and in amateur radio, there are very specific protocols. So it kind of evolved from a post-war era of a lot of people with uh, technologies and largely uh, access to resources who were mainly white men over the certain age, uh, kind of uh, setting up radio shacks and becoming radio amateurs. And largely it includes like exchanges of like technical information, like what your antenna is, what your signal strength is. People will say like, I'm reading you five and nine, five and nine, which just means like very good signal. And like 73 is like best wishes. So there's like these kinds of like numerical like dialogues, but you can't talk about culture or politics or religion, but yeah, there's a blurry border. Say your call sign? M7 Hotel Kilo Whiskey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so dry. Can you see second row, woman with her hand up? This is last one now. Okay. Sorry. We'll come and chat to you at the back later, though. Please stick around. 
Thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask, um, because you're all artists, do you have something in mind when you're listening out or are you inspired after you've heard things or do you have a particular focus when you're listening? I just wondered. For me, it's more about just finding anything. What, like what, what is out there? I'm not trying to find a particular signal. Um, hmm. That's a really nice question because we talk a lot about plural, plural listening or pluralities, um, and uh, often where listening to each other um, and each other's location through a device so we can hear the environment and the device, what the device is picking up, what, what the local fence is listening to, um, <laughs> for example. Um, and, and with what we pick up, um, it's an open range of signals. So it's kind of dependent on your location, also atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of really site specific, time specific. And I don't know, we just kind of, are enamoured by listening to that. What would you call that? I love the mix as well. When yeah, you, sometimes you can mix. hear like three stations at the same time yeah. and they waft in and out. And we play games with our antennas where you can throw your antenna into the air and then you can hear this real spike in signals. Uh, Lisa, who's another member of our collective, talks about it like crossing a sort of invisible ceiling. Mm -hmm. where there's a ceiling and once you reach, your antenna gets to a certain height, then it suddenly opens out all of these other signals that are floating around in the air. So there's a sort of magic in trying to capture what's there. You sometimes listen to people's conversations, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that was a lovely note, though, like yeah. a kind of invisible ceiling, catching signals, the mix of signals, because I think we're, we're kind of at time, unless I've misread the... the we just... Thank uh, Dee, our BSL interpreter, who uh, also uh, was talking about radio waves uh, with us. And it is contextual, but this is kind of the sign you could do. The radio waves. Yeah. <laughs> so we can all take that away tonight. <laughs> Unless you already know it. <laughs>
Uh, hi everyone, thanks for uh, joining us here this evening. Um, I always find it a massive privilege as a curator when I'm invited to people's studios and then to be invited by Tate to do talks at these Tate Lates and to have a chat, which is too short if I can talk to the public pro programming team, uh, but to have a chat with two very incredible people um, that I've got to know over the last week or so. It's gonna be an honor sharing that with you. Uh, one of them is Ella Feiner, who is a writer, a lecturer, a composer, a curator. Is there anything else we need to add into that list? No, and you did that on purpose. Because <laughs> we were talking a lot about definition and especially self-definition and, and when you're asked to call yourself something, but also that the relationship to sound in terms of definition. So thanks, Kobe, for putting me as everything. I'm actually going to get in trouble for that. Um, and also, Margarita Luca, um, who I've controversially referred to as a DJ. And um, they've had a show on NTS almost since NTS began. And as a DJ, you don't like to, well, you're a person that plays music on NTS, a radio show, which is now two hours. Do you want to sh share it? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know if it is controversial not calling me a DJ. I mean, we've discussed this privately. I don't play live. I, I'm not producing my own music. Um, I also really dislike labels, which we've talked about. Um, so I, I've described myself as a really terrible host. That's how I'd summarize it. Um, but yeah, I have been on NTS for over a decade. Originally, I used to do two shows a month, uh, four hours in total. Um, but sadly, I don't have enough time to indulge that these days. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Because you're also a lecturer at Central St. Martins. Yes, so I, um, I'm the digital lead for the fashion program at St. Martins, um, which means I teach across all of the BAs and MAs, design and uh, image. Um, <clears throat> and it probably seems like there isn't a lot of crossover, but actually my students have really expansive practices. Um, so it's really exciting for me to be able to integrate my external interests with their work. Um, and I, I, we were talking about this as well. I think there's a kind of fluidity to working with sound and, and also curating and performance, so. Yeah, I mean, even as we're speaking, we can hear something from another space. And at first I was thinking, oh, is that, is that the whale coming in again a bit, kind of erroneously? But, you know, I mean, I think this also speaks to our kind of a kind of human desire to um, to to have something fixed, to have something kind of knowable or legible, call it a name, and um, and actually the fact that sound always resists that is something that's kind of irresistible to me. And I know through talking with both of you, also to you, like the fact it won't stay in place, it will move and it will come into this space now. And also we just went round. Um, the Yoko Ono exhibition together beforehand and kind of hearing the telephone, the ringing telephone in the first kind of antechamber and then moving through and hearing it and gradually the telephone getting quieter and quieter. But then as you get to the end, remembering it and so it replays then again in memory, like all these ways that sound plays tricks on us and it's always resisting the kind of, I'm a writer and I'm a lecturer and a, Composer, I find really difficult. It's probably like your DJ. It's like I use composing as a method, but I wouldn't, I feel really I, like I was taking up a lot of space. And what do you mean by that? You use composer as a method? Composing. Composing. Yeah, yeah. composing. Well, because I mean, <laughs> this, this is probably a kind of a wider conversation that leaks out of the boundaries of this one. But, um, because I write as well as work with sound, I'm really interested in how composition happens um, across language and across um, kind of acoustic materials, immaterial um, forces. And I guess this, oh look, uh, did you change this to this, this so slide? It's a magical person. <laughs> wow, that's amazing timing. Um, <coughs> because when you were all coming in, there was this 
sound, this kind of deep sound playing in it. I hate to give away what that is, um, because sometimes you kind of want to keep the mystery of what it is that you're hearing. But that is the sound of a blue whale voice, uh, and it's sped up three to three different frequencies. And that's a document that's held in the British Library Sound Archive as completely silent. And so it's this really strange document um, that, of course, can only be heard if it's sped up to within human audible range. Should we have a moment of silence to hear the applause from the other room? Um, I quite like honouring also what's happening in the parallel space. But I guess this is a useful thing to kind of think about in terms of composition, because this really is writing through sound. It's like composing thoughts in, into the written word, which is such a strange thing for me, because again, it's like fixing thoughts which are always in motion. But thinking of ways that we might um, write by ear or attend to writing as this kind of vibrant and flexible mode of communication. There's, there's something else about how, having read a couple of your articles now, and the first one which I read, which was about keening and the Green and Cromwell process. And what I loved about that was how your words breathe life into how often there are sounds, movements, sounds reflective of political movements sometimes, which are not given life and not given breath. And you were talking about, um, I think you said the word connection or overlap or something like that. And what I've been finding through this journey of speaking to you independently and now together is the overlaps of where three very different people, very different practices overlap. And what the overlap which I see, well, I don't, don't want to ruin the build up, but the overlap which I see is how when you highlight people protesting outside parliament and MPs, unless they specifically mention the protests that people can hear outside of parliament, if they mention it, then it gets recorded into Hansard, that you were kind of highlighting how sound can be given life if it's been recorded in some kind of way. And the reason why the sound of the whales was introducing us into that space kind of nods towards how to hear it, we have to slow it down to, is that really a sound if we're manipulating it in such a way? Is it really a protest if it has to be recorded by an MP saying it? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I'm interested in this in relation to your work as well, Margarita. This, um, so it's sped up, the whales. I mean, great, if we slowed it down, it'd be like, it's there, it's there somewhere. Um, but exactly, exactly this, like, for example, we were talking about um, before w with all of us, um, when, when you have a show and you don't speak, for example, and, the kind of, and what happens when you speak, what happens for the listener's experience when you speak? And we were talking about speech almost kind of being a, being a beckoning to attention, like asking for some kind of response, even if that other person isn't in the room. We might be listening to something in the background and we hear a voice and we, we attune to it differently. But I was really interested in when you were saying that. And also especially kind of what and how, kind of how you navigate when to speak through the through your own listening? Yeah. It, we, we've talked about how I've put together the shows, and um, I was saying it's not quite intuition, but it's it's really paying attention to where I'm at in the moment and the kind of the wider conversations and the general mood. And, like, recently, I mean, I say recently, it's probably close to a year that I haven't actually spoken on the show because it just didn't feel appropriate. And a lot of the music or the sound pieces that I've selected actually have other people's voices that I think are a lot more potent and have much more immediate messages to communicate, you know. Um, and also, I think in my daily life, I'm that person in the room speaking constantly <laughs> to my students, you know. I don't, I don't necessarily think I need to speak. I'd really hope that people can just, well, like we were saying, Put the put the mix on and and let it wash over them and and pay attention to the nuances. You know they don't need me talking about what the track idea is. It's yeah. not S the point. So in a world where we're so used to, for those of us that grew up in a world where we listened to commercial radio, where pluggers were pushing the new tracks, where it was all just 
pre-algorithm, algorithm-based shows, you create programming on NTS, which is experiential for you, experiential for your audience. And where does that experience start? You were saying earlier, but I'd like to invite people into that conversation. You, uh, where does that experience start? Or where does that nexus of how you program a show begin? So I put the shows together quite quickly. It's, it's usually, uh, you know, two to four days. Um, maybe that isn't quick, actually. I, I, I consider it quick. Um, but I'm often thinking throughout the entire month leading up to that and I'm sort of like quietly paying attention to things and um, I'm always really keen to see what new releases there are or if there are records that I'm going back to in my own collection they'll often kind of find their way in there um, and often it's about just finding that first track so something that really speaks to me in that moment when I've decided I'm going to start and it really is as simple as that and it's it's funny, sometimes the show comes together effortlessly, so quickly, it feels like, yep, this is right. And then other, other weeks, it's a real battle. Uh, you talked about the first track. Could we take us, everyone, back to the 11th of December, 2023? Um, the first track was by a Korean artist called... See, this is also why I don't talk, because <laughs> I don't want to butcher everybody's names. <laughs> so leave it to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they so bake. And it's called Intro, and we'll be listening to that now. Does that bring back memories for you? Yeah, it's a great record. I really need to listen to that again immediately. <laughs> we were talking in the back, and uh, I think you asked me, how and why did you choose that? Yeah. It was sick. <laughs> it's really sick. No, I was just so interested how you, know, how you go in and, and select something. I think this is another thing we've been talking about. Of course, listening is always a practice of selection. You know, we choose what we hear. You might not even be listening to us. You might be listening to what's happening in the other room. And of course, th you know, that's, that's, that's appropriate. We cannot hold those two things at once. We might hear them, but we can't listen, like, focus in on them. And so I was just really interested why you'd pick that one. Because also I said to Margarita, oh, well, I went right back through your, um, through your programs because I wanted to find the very first one. And then I realized as I was listening to what I thought was the very first one, just because it was the last in the list, that um, Margarita said, oh, because we really like playing this kind of stuff. And I thought, ah, right, I'm not at the first one. There's a backstory that I'm completely missing. And then Margarita, you said... Uh, we've actually lost quite a few of the early shows. They've just disappeared into the digital ether. So the early shows of NTS are just gone? Mine, definitely. Um, because obviously we were transferring from different audio players and uh, I was saying that I, uh, for, for some reason, that it didn't even occur to me to keep my own archive necessarily I, because it was such an immediate thing that I did in the moment and was just excited to share. Yeah. Um, so I actually couldn't tell you. Yeah. I mean, I have the pilot show somewhere, but beyond that. And how does that feel for you, to, for these sounds which you've put together for these shows? It's okay. It's actually, it's, it's exactly what you were saying. I think sound needs to escape. It needs to be experienced. You know, I kind of like that I've not captured it. Yeah. And also because we were saying, and this also links to Kobe's work that we'll hear, which will be brilliant, um, because it links in this way, I think, across all of us about the kind of pluralized and obscure origin stories of, of sound and that there's never necessarily one. We might think that we have this illusion of one. Um, but of course, even me speaking, all of us speaking, are mediated through these. Perhaps if we took them away, then, then you know, we might be closer to that one source, but even still mediated through the air. And so actually the fact that it's, it's 
disappeared. You know? It's very, it's very like what happened with Silent Whale. Like all these different kinds of beginnings of a, of a project that, in some ways, kind of produce myths, like produce strange, made up um, scenarios or even conversations, um, which actually I, I really love. Because it becomes something closer, like we were all saying when we went round the Oko Ono exhibition, that we really loved this kind of commitment to word of mouth. Like you, you want, uh, you you don't necessarily rely on the kind of the paper or the written or the email communication now, but obviously not then. Um, but to rely on word of mouth as the mode of communication, which comes up as well in your work, Kobe. You're really pushing for this. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, and it's interesting that you can be so free about your earliest recordings at NTS going missing. And as a curator working a lot within black and queer communities, so much is an oral history, so much is an oral learning. Um, so much gets lost as a result that I see it as our jobs to make sure that never, nothing gets lost anymore, that there's an archive which is being contributed to. There's a colleague of mine who is sometimes way more intelligent than me. And he introduced me into Pauline Oliveros, the composer and writer. And she talks about how listening is the core of all of our cultures, our shared cultures. And there's a, the, we all know there is a difference between listening and hearing. And I love that point of difference as an understanding of that difference between listening and hearing. And listening is an active choice, and I think you were talking about this a little bit earlier as well. Listening is an active job, it's his work, um, and we have to get engaged with things. And at this beginning of an exhibition which I did recently in a venue, at a venue which wasn't Take Modern, um, which was a rave exhibition called Move 003, we used the tenuous link of having drum and bass DJs, jungle DJs as part of that exhibition, to talk about an initiative called Keep the Drums, Lose the Knife. Keep the Drums, Lose a Knife is an initiative set up by Sarianne Kamara, um, who is working to interrupt the culture of female genital mutilation in Sierra Leone and the UK. And so by using that tenuous link of drumming the drum, the ancestral drum for so many of us, all of us, we had and we created this conversation with Sarianne Kamara. I, thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, with Sarianne Kamara about her initiative the picture which you'll see in a second behind you was taken by a guy who's not related to her, Henry J. Kamara. Um, and it's of women, uh, female drummers, who when they do their fundraising and um, campaigning activities, these events start at six o'clock in the evening and they go on till six o'clock in the morning, just like any other rave that some of us experience here in the West. But the book there, which Henry has put together of photographs of these events, are all about interrupting that culture of female genital mutilation. So when we talk about sounds that um, are in the British Library Archive, or when we talk about artists who sometimes we were fearful of butchering their names, or even shows which get lost, there's that purpose of being able to actually capture things and make sure that some things don't get lost. And so, if you'd be so kind, um, we're going to listen to about two minutes of Sarian Kamara, but at the beginning, you'll hear the drums. <laughs> You know, when I talk about the, the, the drums, the joy that the drums bring, you, you just forget. You don't think about anything else. When they beat the drums, especially for Bundu, there's something, there's this, there's this energy that women will get. You know, I think it, it, it is deep. It's deep. It, it, it really connects to your pain. Yeah, it's connect to your pain. You could it, you could see it. Clearly see. It. I keep the drums loose the knife. Um, it's formed 
because of my experience of female genital mutilation, which we know as the Bundo Society back home. Um, the reason why I come up with the name Keep the Drums, Lose the Knife, is because um, back home in Sierra Leone, we use drum to celebrate the practice of FGM. When they hit the drums, it doesn't matter where you... The, the sounds of the Bundo drum is different from any other drum, any other sound. You understand? Like the way they will beat drums for naming ceremony, beat drums for wedding, and the drums, the sound of the drums for Bundo practice is different. So if you are an initiate of the Bundo society, once you hear the drums, you stop what you do because it's its tradition for you to come and support the women to help suppress the voice of the girl being caught so that as Bundo women, you continue to keep the practice a secret. In the last couple of weeks, I've been talking with Ella and I've been talking with Margarita and what one of my questions was, I don't understand why we've been brought together. But the thread which I was talking about earlier was that it's incredible the richness and depth of work which you both commit to, um, creating shows, projects, books. What I love is that you highlight sounds, movements, voices that aren't otherwise normally heard in the mainstream. You made me realize that we do something similar at Finstudio. Um, but it's that listening thing which we all need to engage with. And it's an active choice. And it's something which is so vital right now for each and every one of us and not just here in this room, listening in an active way to voices which aren't normally listened to. So thank you for what you've been doing and what you've helped me realize over the last week or two. And seriously, thank you for what you've been doing. It's that active choice of listening. This, do you wanna? No, I just, I mean, I, I, the feeling is beyond mutual. It's been such a joy. Um, we've really been struggling to keep this to half an hour, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but yeah, what, what you're both doing is phenomenal in my eyes. So. Honestly, <coughs> Without this becoming a kind of public mutual appreciation <laughs> fest, I have to say, um, you know, we talked when Kobe and I met, it's part of the joke of why Kobe put so many things for what I am or what I'm not. <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I said, like, how did you come to call yourself curator? And we talked about Kobe's amazing, amazingly rich background that is beyond curation. But the point at which like actually a lot of different practices converge. And of course, the kind of well-worn um, discussion around the etymology of curation and caretaking. But really, just like listening can be institutionalized for you know, all kinds of missions <laughs> and become like really emptied out of what, what it can do, so too can curatorship as caretaking. And it, what you've done is you've brought together all our work in this really extraordinarily rich way. And actually, this was such a wonderful way to kind of to provisionally end. I'm just looking at the time. We've got a little bit more time. But, because it is also a reminder of the activist work of listening. And also, when you were talking about like where, you know, the, it's important also to collect and to preserve um, as well as, you know, Margarita and my kind of dispersal, preservation as dispersal is also, you know, it's, it's, it, it is sound. But where to preserve, where to make that huge effort to preserve materially, which is a huge effort because it's always moving from technology to different technology to, um, to different kind of file formats now, of course. And... Um, and so it's also a reminder of to, to kind of think about where these things are preserved. And so to come back to your work, Kobe, and your studio, this kind of attention on who is preserving who, 
who is collecting who, whom, sorry, I should be grammatically correct. Um, and, and, you know, and the importance of thinking of those kinds of power dynamics in, um, in how sound is stored and kept. Yeah. But thank you is the kind of main, <laughs> main point. And um, future work, you'll be doing more shows? I mean, hopefully. <laughs> it's been going for so long. So long, you're an institute. Unintentionally, yeah. so yes, I'm very grateful to NTS for letting yeah. me hang around this long, to be honest. So. And then you've got, maybe you're working on another book in the future? Oh yeah, well, <laughs> well you know what, in the, le in the last couple of minutes, I, I gave a talk recently about how to end something, because I was like, I cannot end anything. And, um, and this book, I think, wants to exist in sound, just mm. in, in all the different places it is. Um, but no, it, it, I think it has to come to its end. And this is a book that started actually with another recording from the sound archive, another kind of strange, errant recording that didn't really fit. Um, which is of a swan's heartbeat. Something that I says it says, <laughs> something I says is um, wilder than wildlife, which is the category that it's supposedly contained in. Um, we were talking before. I should just say about also the work of um, signing and how much effort it is. And um, so I'd also really like to say thank you to to you for signing all these talks. We talked about the energy it takes. You know, the energy it takes to listen, but then also to translate. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, the screen is going to flip behind us, so you can follow or get in touch with the contributors up on this stage in any way that you'd like. Um, but we have just a little bit of time if anyone has any questions before we get kicked out of here. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you.